He is risen. Indeed, he has, and it is so good to worship with you on this Easter Sunday morning. The sun is out. It is springtime. How many of you have already finished your spring cleaning? Raise your hand. All three of you. My wife has been spring cleaning. She was deep into one of our closets, and I'm sitting in my office, and she, she brings me a tray of stuff, and I'm like, I remember that stuff. I had totally forgotten that that stuff belonged to me. And of course, now she lays it on my lap and I got to do something with it. And, and, and when you, you know, you're, you're either going to be one of three types of people, right? When it comes to this, like you, either you are the type of person where you don't do spring cleaning, you just do pushing, you just push stuff in corners. Like you, you just like, okay, let's put this in this crack and put this in this crevice and put this in this, you know, this drawer and I'll just deal with it later. You, that, you, how many of you are that type of person? Yeah, you just push it away. I get it. You just, this is my lane. I just stay in it. Some of you are compartmentalizers. Like you don't throw stuff away, but you put it in a box. Like you're going to find a tub or maybe a bigger tub and you're just going to keep putting it in and putting your all neat in your closet. You, anybody like that? A carpet, okay, then and some of you are throwawayers, right? Amen, say amen. Like the, your, the favorite thing in your life is to watch the trash truck come up Dump your trash and take it to some place where you don't know. Right? Hey, man. Anybody like that? Right. The, you're the throwaways. All right. So you're one of those type of people, right? And and and, and we're all we're all different. And and this is the time of year where you you got to deal with your physical stuff. But on this day, Sunday, Easter Sunday, I want to have you consider your spiritual stuff, the excess sins in your life your spiritual rubbish. So what do you do with that? What do you do with it? I mean, maybe you're just one of those people who are like, I know, look, I know I'm struggling. I got some sins and I, but here's, I'm just going to push them aside. Let me just push them down in the cracks and crevices of my heart. I'll deal with these things later, right? You know, I, I know I got sin. I'll just deal with it later. Well, maybe you're the type of person like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just put this in a box. I, I know, like, I'll be, you know, I need to go back to church. Look, I was here in Easter. I, I need to keep coming back. I'll, I'll come back. I'll deal with this sin later, right? I'll deal, I'll deal with this later. I know, I know I'm not perfect. No one is. But maybe, maybe some of you are like, I want to get rid of this. I want this removed from me. My pride my jealousy, my anger, my unforgiveness, my lusts, my, my lack of love for God, my, my lack of love for others. That's, what do I do with this? What do I do with all this excess sin in my life? I mean, what do you do with it? Maybe a more important question is what does God do with it? I mean, here's a holy and a perfect God relate to you and you've got all this sin stuck to you a sin attached to you what does God do with your excess spiritual baggage and then how is it possible that that you can have a relationship with him and you can dwell in his presence when you got all this sin stuck to you how is it possible and so what you do with your spiritual baggage becomes essential my friend because God really wants for you to have a relationship with him he wants you to live in his presence but you've got to do something about your sin and then beyond that since this is easter why do you think you should go to heaven i mean heaven's a perfect place if you were to show up there today you would ruin everything why do you think you should get there and how is it that you're going to rid yourself of every imperfection, even the imperfection of your own physical body, so that you can live forever in the glorious presence of your Creator and your Savior? Well, today I, I want to take you on a journey. And we're going to go all the way back and begin in the book of Leviticus. Yes, of all places on Easter Sunday, I want you to find Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus chapter 16. So I want to take you on this journey from a place the Bible calls the mercy seat and then take you to the cross and then take you to an empty tomb. And I want to show you how you can make sure 
that all that sinful baggage can be gone and gone forever in your life. There's three lessons about what it demands in order for God to have a relationship with you or with us, how we can live in the presence of God. And here's the first. God will remain in the presence of his people if and only if we have been purified by sacrificial blood. God will remain in our presence if we have been purified by atoning blood. Now, Leviticus 16 talks about a very special day of the year. It's not a spring cleaning day, it's a fall cleaning day because there is a day every fall that the nation of Israel had to stop everything, couldn't work, couldn't do anything. It had to, all, they all had to gather at the place called the tabernacle for this special day of cleansing. The sins of Israel would be cleansed that day. The sins of the priests, the place where the priests made their offerings, and the sins of the people all would be purified on what is called the Day of Atonement. Remember that, the Day of Atonement. The sins of the priests, the place where they worship, and the sins of the people all the pollution would be cleansed that day by way of sacrificial blood. And, and now it would be possible after this day for God to remain in the presence of his people so they can enjoy him for another year. So let's pick up in verse 1 of Le Leviticus 16. And this is what Moses wrote for not just for the Israelites, but for you and I today. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of two of Aaron's sons when they approached the presence of the Lord and died. The Lord said to Moses, you tell your brother Aaron that he may not come whenever he wants into the holy place behind the curtain in front of the mercy seat on the ark or else he will die because I appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. If you were here last week, we heard this very unfortunate story where the tabernacle had been set up, the people of God now had a place to worship, sacrifices were being made, but two of Aaron's sons who had been anointed as priests, they decided to enter into the holy place and offer something that God didn't want, that God never ordained. They were very selfish and foolish, and they made the wrong offering there in front of the veil at the altar of incense. God not only didn't receive it, God judged them for it. And a holy and righteous God killed them. He killed them. And then he said to Moses, okay, now everything's dirty. These priests have polluted my tent. Now the tent is filthy and unclean. The people now are unclean. Everything needs to be cleansed. Everything. And the only way to cleanse sin is by way of the shed blood. The blood becomes the only detergent that can cleanse and wash away sin. So, so the Lord says to Moses, now you go tell your brother Aaron, who's the high priest, don't think you can just enter into my presence anytime you want. And so he gave specific instructions as to when the high priest could enter into the very presence of God because in, in the tabernacle is this huge, huge place and there was a courtyard where the Israelites could go and offer their sacrifices on this huge altar. But then the priests were able to actually go into the tent where there were two compartments. There was a holy place and a most holy place. And they were divided by this veil, very thick veil. The holy place would have been a, a lampstand and a table with bread. And, and then there was this small altar that was always burning incense. It symbolized the prayers of the saints. And the priests would attend to this every day. But only once a year could someone go beyond the veil because you see it was there beyond the veil where the presence of God dwelt. 
That's where God came down from heaven and rested his glorious and holy and righteous presence right there on top of a square box called the Ark of the Covenant. It was the only thing in the most holy place. There was this gold box and it was in this room that was perfectly square inlaid with the purest of gold. And here's this gold box. And in, on top of this gold box was this gold slab. That's all it was. It was just a slab of gold. But they had fashioned two angels on each side of the box. And they resembled cherubim. They had wings. And so on one side, the angel stretched its wings over like this. On the other side, the angel stretched its wings over like this. And then there was this empty space there in the middle and the, and the angels were looking down in the middle, right? Down there in the middle. And then so here's this gold box, this, this slab of gold, and the angels are pointing their wings and looking down, and there's nothing there. It's just empty. What were they looking at? There wasn't like an idol there of a god. There wasn't a bunch of idols there. There, there, there wasn't anything that had been fashioned because you cannot depict God by way of some idols. Like, what are you going to do? try to manufacture some image that, that represents God. God said, you can't do that. Don't ever make an image of me. Don't make an idol of me. I am the Almighty. And so the space was just empty. And, and what God would do, he would just rest his cloud of glory upon that space, on that slab. And when God did that, that most holy place, which was usually pitch black, became flooded with the light of heaven and the glory of God, and the angels were there watching this. And in that place, right there in the middle of that gold slab was called the mercy seat. Now you're gonna understand why it was called the mercy seat in just a moment. Now, here's the thing. The high priest, Aaron, had to somehow get in there in order to make the atoning sacrifice on the mercy seat, but he had to do it without dying. So now we've got a problem on our hands because Aaron is an imperfect man. So the Lord is going to give instructions as to how this is going to take place. Verse three, Aaron is to enter the most holy place in this way, right? It has to be this way. And again, it's just once a year with a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. And he's got to wear different clothes on this day. He used to wear a holy linen tunic, linen undergarments are to be on his body. He's to tie a linen sash around him, wrap his head in a linen turban. These are holy garments. He has to bathe his body with water before he wears them. And then he is to take from the Israelite community two male goats, for a sin offering, and there's a, another male goat, we'll learn about the purpose of that, second one later, and then also take a ram for a burnt offering. Now, uh, typically, Aaron is the high priest, would have these elaborate clothes, gloriously looking clothing, just beautiful colors, beautiful linen with gems and gold dallions and the whole thing, because the high priest represented the tabernacle, which represented the glory of heaven, right? And so he was heavenly in his dress, but on this day, None of that. The high priest just simply takes a bath, scrubs his skin, and puts on white linen clothes. He has to confront the glorious presence of God in humility on this day. He has to deal with his sin and his pollution. He just wears these pure white linen clothes. And, and because he's not a perfect high priest, he, he can only approach a perfect and glorious God by way of shed blood. Something has to pay for his sin. So he, he brings an offering of blood, this beautiful male cow, this bull, and, and then a ram so that he can make the appropriate sacrifice. But now he's got to get, somehow, he's got to get the blood inside the veil. So now, verse 6. Aaron will present the bull for his sin offering and make atonement for himself and his household. Let me stop you there. The word atonement means covering. 
It means that that God accepts the sacrifice and covers over your sin, completely covered over by the blood sacrifice. And now Aaron is going to perform a sin offering for himself and all the priesthood. All the priests have got to be cleansed on this day. Next, verse 7, he will take two goats and place them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Aaron will cast lots for the two goats. So basically what lots are is sort of like holy dice, or it's like drawing sticks, like it's the shorter one. And these two goats will receive labels. And on one label, it will say, for the Lord. And on the other label, it will say, for Azazel, or for an uninhabited place, right? So each ghost gets a label. One for the Lord, one for a distant place. And, and, and then, once he presents the goat chosen for the Lord, it will be sacrificed as a sin offering, but the goat chosen for an uninhabitable place, your, your Bible translation may say Azazel, that's Hebrew, for an uninhabitable place. Or your Bible may say scapegoat, scapegoat, because that goat performs a duty that you'll learn about here in a minute to go into an uninhabitable place. And, and, and this is all in order to make atonement with the goat by sending it into the wilderness, right? So now Aaron, he's outside of the tabernacle and he's got all of the animals that need to be sacrificed, two male goats, ram and the bull. Now it's time for Aaron first to make his sin offering right there before the Lord. Verse 11, when Aaron presents the bull for his sin offering and makes atonement for himself and his household, he will slaughter the bull for his sin offering. So we've learned about this if you've been here, if not, I would highly encourage you to go on our website and listen to the last few sermons in Leviticus. Because Aaron's now, he, he has to transfer his sin onto this animal. The animal is brought forth. Aaron would lay his hands on and lean onto the bull. And he would plead with the Lord to transfer or impute his sin onto the bull. And now... The bull becomes the substitute for Aaron. He bears the sin. He is now judged for the sin. And that judgment of sin demands death because the wages of sin is what? The wages of sin is what? That's what you earn. You earn death when you sin against a holy God. So the bull dies. And as the bull's throat is slid, Aaron receives the shed blood in a basin. And now let's read what he does with it. So he, he is to take a fire pan full of blazing coals from the altar before the Lord and two handfuls of finely ground fragrant incense and bring them inside the curtain. He is to put the incense on the fire before the Lord so that the cloud of incense covers the mercy seat that is over the testimony or else he will die. All right, so now, here's Aaron, white linen. He's got the basin of blood. This is his sin offering. He enters into the holy place. He's been there before. But now he's got to go behind the veil where the presence of God is. He has a pan and he gets close to the veil and there's this altar of incense always burning and he scoops out a couple of hot coals and then he has a couple of handfuls of fragrant incense just as the Lord had commanded and he throws a couple of handfuls of that incense on the hot coals and smoke starts billowing. And then he takes that fire pan with his billowing smoke, he must have been terrified to do this. I would be just mortified to do this. And he moves the veil where the presence of a holy God is and he puts 
the fire pan with the smoke billowing inside and he just waits a minute until the entire room is filled with this cloud of smoke because if Aaron were to go in there too quickly and be faced with the presence of God, he would die. So he, he fills the room with the smoke, pulls his hand out. Now it's time for him to go in. And here's what it says. He is to take some of the bull's blood and sprinkle it with his fingers against the east side of the mercy seat. And then he will sprinkle some of the blood with his finger before the mercy seat seven times. So now the high priest has to remove the veil again, take the basin of blood, and step inside. Cloudy, filled with incense, he stands in front of this ark, and there's the empty slab. The angels are looking at the middle, and he puts his finger in the basin of blood, and in a perfect number of times, he sprinkles it on the east side of that mercy seat. Right there in this emptiness, he, he sprinkles the blood seven times, seven times. And then he leaves. And now the angels have something to look at, do they not? And for the next year, what are the angels looking at? They're looking at the blood. This is the atoning sacrifice. God now has something to look at for the next year. He focuses on the blood that has covered his people, so he's not having to focus on all of their sins. That is the atoning sacrifice. I, I, I'm not sure why the east side, I actually had to do some research from some rabbinic scholars, non-Christian scholars, some Jewish scholars about this. And what I learned is that, that they are taught that the high priest always sprinkles the east side of the mercy seat because the east side would always be closest to the Mount of Olives, where there was a place where the Israelites would await to, to sacrifice a red heifer. But but for Christians, that place just outside of, of the Mount of Olives is a place that we know, we call it Calvary. The shed blood was sprinkled there closest to Calvary. Now the sins of the people were atoned for. And, and, and so the high priest leaves and Aaron has been purified, but now he's got to go back and do it again because now... He's got to purify the people. The priests have been purified. Now the people have to be purified, verse 15. So one of the two male goats, blood is shed. He does the same thing. And he goes and sprinkles the blood against the mercy seat right there in front of it. In verse 16, when he does this, it says, he will make atonement for the most holy place in this way for all their sins because of the Israelites' impurities and because of their rebellious acts. And then he will do the same for the tent of meeting that remains among them because it is surrounded by their impurities. So he has to go through the whole process again in order to make the sin sacrifice and atone for the sins of all the people so that their God would focus on the blood which covers all of their sins as they committed last year. The list must have been a mile long. All their sin. The blood atonement covered. Friends, the, the list of your sin is tremendously long. And, and, and you're like, you might be the type of person where you're just like, I just want to push it away. I don't want to deal with it. I just want to compartmentalize it. But what does God do with it? What does he do with the a million and one sins that are on your list? The list that grows every single day. What does God do with them? 
And you, you cannot enjoy his presence unless those sins are cleansed, unless those sins are purified. But if they are, now you can enjoy the presence of God. But they've got to be purified by the right shed blood. Now, the second lesson is this. God will remain in the presence of his people, okay, first, if the sins are purified, but second, if the sins are completely removed. Once you're purified, you've got to take these sins and you've got to completely remove them, all of them from you. Every single one has got to be removed from you as far as possible. So verse 20 says, When he has finished making atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting, and the altar, so so now Aaron has purified himself and the priests. He's purified the people. As he's backing away from the most holy place, has sprinkled the blood, he starts sprinkling blood everywhere, on the veil, on the altar of incense, on the table, on the lampstands, on the doors. Just He's washing everything and cleansing everything with the blood. He comes out to the courtyard, this huge altar, and he's shaking the blood on the altar. He's cleansing everything, and now everything has been cleansed. Now we gotta get rid of all the garbage. All of your anger, all of your unforgiveness, all of your doubt, all of your apathy, your laziness, all of the lack of love that you have for God and your lack of loving each other, all of those sins is somehow it's gotta be taken away. And here's what happened for Israel. The live male goat would be presented and Aaron would lay both of his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all, that's a big word, all of the Israelites' iniquities and all of their rebellious acts. In other words, all their sins would be placed upon this live goat. (laughs) And he's to put them on the goat's head and send it away into the wilderness by a man appointed for the task. The goat will carry all the iniquities into a desolate land and then the man will release it there. This only happens once a year. Aaron takes this this male goat. The other male goat's already been sacrificed. And now this male goat must perform this most sacred task. And he puts his hands on it and he pleads that God would take the entirety of the sins of Israel. And now look, most of these sins are sins that people didn't even know they, they committed. And it's the same goes with us, by the way, Like the biggest list of your sins that God knows about are the ones you don't even know about because your heart is deceitful and wicked. You don't even know it, but God does. So this is God's list of sins. And he takes all of them and he puts it, he puts it on this male goat. And then Aaron, he's got his hands on the goat. All the sins come on this goat. And now Aaron backs up. And a man who's been appointed takes this leash and starts leading this goat away from the tabernacle, away from the people of Israel. And they keep walking and walking and walking and walking for miles after miles until they get to Azazel the uninhabitable place where no one lives, no one can find this place, and that goat would never, ever be able to make its way back into the camp of Israel because if it did, it's bringing all the sin back. And when he gets to the uninhabitable place, he lets go the goat, and the goat just walks away until it dies. And then he starts coming back. And in doing so, he has taken away the sins from the people. You know, King David saw this happen year after year. And he even wrote about it in one of his songs. As he watched this goat 
take the sin away from the nation of Israel. He said in Psalm 103, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, that's how far the Lord has removed sins from us. That's how far. And in this then became a permanent statute, verse 29. Every year, the seventh month, 10th day of the month, you are to practice self-denial, don't work. Whether you're Jew or Gentile, all of you who resides amongst Israel, atonement will be made for you on this day to cleanse you, and you will be clean from all your sins before the Lord. And so now you've got another year to enjoy the presence of God. Another year, then another year, and another year. And as the people continued to practice this year after year, they were waiting for the Messiah to come, hoping that one day when Messiah would come, he would then cleanse his people forever. And 1,500 years later, <laughs> we move from the mercy seat to the cross because Messiah came, amen? And we know him as Jesus. Perfect and pure. Born of a virgin, he did not have a sin nature. He lived a perfect life. Performed miracles, he proved that he was more than a man. He's also our divine God. And yet he came to this earth in order to become three things for you. The sin offering, the high priest, and the scapegoat to carry away your sins. And sure enough, all of that happened as he died on the cross. The people rejected him, especially the religious leaders. They had him murdered. They thought that they were finally going to get rid of him, but all of that was God's sovereign will for us to receive the once and for all sacrifice. Oh, his cousin John knew what, this was, what, what was going on. You remember when John the Baptist, who was uh, pronouncing the kingdom and he's baptizing all these folks, saying, repent, the kingdom of God has come. And then his cousin Jesus shows up and he, he tells the crowd and he points to Jesus and he says, you see that man? That's the Lamb of God who will do what? Take away, take away the sin of the world. That's the scapegoat. That guy right there. And they nailed Jesus to a cross, and as he bled, he then allowed his own shed blood to become our sin offering. He became the perfect sacrificial lamb. At the same time, he was also the high priest, making the offering of his own blood to a holy God. He was able to go into the more perfect veil. He was able to approach God himself in order to make such a sacrifice. He was the one who was dragged outside of Jerusalem, outside, right there, just outside of the Mount of Olives at a place called Calvary. Everything that you needed was accomplished when Jesus died for you. That was the once and for all sacrifice. And, and with that sacrifice, now, if you believe in him, your sins have been purified, completely cleansed. And, and now, if you understand that Jesus is the lamb who takes away the sins of the world, then you have to understand that by faith in Jesus Christ, your sin has been so far removed from you, it can never find its way back to you. Amen? Never. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far your sin is from you because of what Jesus has accomplished. And now you get to enjoy the presence of Christ. You get to enjoy the presence of God. By God's spirit, you're able to obey the law. There's only one thing left. And that's your old messed up physical body. I'm looking at it. Spiritually, you're clean if you're a Christian, but you still got some work to do on that body. 
Your body's dying. Can't take that body into heaven. That body needs to be resurrected. So Jesus led the way, amen? John chapter 20. Here's the third lesson. God will grant us access to his presence if our sins are purified by the shed blood, if our sins are completely taken away from us. But God will even allow us access to his presence in heaven forever if we are resurrected from our graves and freed from the power of death just like Jesus. Okay, so now John 20. It's early in the morning on Sunday. Jesus had died, was buried, it was still dark out. It's not the high priest who shows up at the tomb. It was a sinner who had met her savior, a very humble woman named Mary of Magdalene. And she was the first person to go to the tomb. She just wanted to check on her master. But when she got there, the, the stone had been rolled away from the tomb and she became very upset. She thought someone had stolen the body or taken the body. So she runs back and she tells the disciples to which Peter and John are like, what? And they go taken off running and they go running all the way. John runs into the tomb and he looks and there's no body there. There's just, there's just the clothes that, that had been wrapped in. And so, so now they're confused. They're not sure what to, to do with that either. And, and so they go back and they're trying to tell the other disciples. And then, and then Mary of Magdalene, she, she comes back and she says, I gotta, I gotta find out what's happened to my teacher, to my master. And so Mary goes back to the tomb and she stood outside of the tomb and she was crying. She was crying. And as she was crying, she actually stepped into that most holy place. And guess what she saw? She saw two angels in white sitting where Jesus' body had been lying there. One was at the head and, and the other was at the feet and stuff. Here's Mary. She steps into this tomb, this most holy place. And she sees a slab of stone, empty. There's two angels on each side looking down and not golden statues. These were the real deal. These were heavenly angels. There's no body to look at. All they see is blood. All they see are blood stains. And in that most holy place stood Mary of all people, humble Mary. She now is able to enter into that holy place because she's about to be in the presence of her God. The angels, they, they, they asked her, they said, woman, why are you crying? She said, because they've taken away my Lord. And, and she said, I don't even know where they've put him. And then having said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there. She didn't know it was Jesus. Woman, Jesus said, why are you crying? Who is it that you're seeking? She thought it was the gardener. She said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will take him from you. I need to know where he is. And then, her shepherd called out to one of his sheep by name and said, Mary. Mary heard her shepherd's voice as she knew it was Jesus. And in her native tongue, she said, Rabboni, which means teacher. And then she obviously lunged to, to hug him. And he said, whoa, not yet. Now things have changed. Don't cling to me. 
He says, I, I, I got to go to heaven. And I haven't yet ascended to the Father. But I need you to go and tell my brothers. I just love the language that Jesus is using now. Tell my brothers that, that I am ascending to my Father. And what does it say? To your Father. To my God. And to your God. And then Mary Magdalene went out and she found the disciples and she said, I have seen the Lord. She told them everything that had happened. It was Mary, not, not a high priest, not a king. It was just humble Mary was the first to see the resurrected Jesus. She was now able to dwell directly in the presence of her gods. And he called her by name. He said, no, my God, your God. And he invited her in. She, he said, go tell others about this. And she did. My friend, the only way that you can enjoy the presence of God is if your sin has been purified, taken away, and you have placed absolute faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what will give you hope, that one day your body will be resurrected as well so that you can enjoy the presence of our holy and almighty God forever and ever and ever. From the mercy seat, to the cross, to an empty tomb. Jesus has made it possible for us to dwell in the presence of God now and forever. Amen. Let's pray. My friends, I'm about to pray, and, and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pray for those here who have yet to place saving faith in Jesus. I, I'm so very glad, if you're not a Christian, that you've come to join us today, that you've witnessed our worship services as we have enjoyed Christ and all he's done for us in the resurrection. But, but let me say this to you. You need a Savior. You cannot die with your sins still stuck to you. So please, please consider that you would do what we have done and confess your sin and repent of it and place your faith and all of your faith in Christ alone for salvation. If you do that, if you do that, everything that I talked about today will happen to you. You will experience purification of sin. Your sins will be taken away and you will have hope for heaven. Let me pray for you. Father, I'm so very glad that there are some people who've joined us today that have yet to place saving faith in Jesus Christ for salvation. But maybe now, even now, they know. They know their sin. They know it. And they know you know it. And they know they need to be forgiven. And they know they're separated from you. But now they know that if they confess their sin and if they receive Christ's sacrifice on the cross on their behalf, if they believe that he actually died, was buried and rose again, that they can be saved. Father, if they're confessing that today, save them, save them by your spirit, change their hearts and save them. And, and Father, I pray that they would let us know that they've made this decision to become a follower of Jesus so that we can come alongside them and walk with them. We will give you so much praise and glory for all that will be saved today, Father. And for us who've already received this gift, please remind us tomorrow how great it is that our sins have been taken away, how wonderful it is that our sins have been covered, how amazing it is that we can enter into your presence every day and help us just to become worshipers that bring you glory and bring you pleasure. It's all for your glory, Father. It's all for your glory. So may we live for your glory as we leave this place. 
in Jesus' name. Amen. 